I have three books that now one of them is complete and ready to go. The other two are in first draft stage and mm -hmm. will be shortly ready to go. The one that was taking the most time was The Most Dangerous Man in the World, which is mm -hmm. based on the lost G.I. Joe episode. Because mm -hmm. in the second season of G.I. Joe, I wanted to do an episode that explained something of the origins of Cobra and something of their operational philosophy. So I came up with this idea about a person who was like the Karl Marx or Frederick Nietzsche of Cobra, the guy mm -hmm. who had the original idea for what Cobra was going to be and what it was fighting for and what its principles were. And it wasn't just a criminal enterprise the way he thought it up. It was going to be it was it was going to be a totalitarian fascist entity but a totalitarian fascist entity with the purpose of bringing stability to the world and just basically keeping everything from flying apart and countries fighting with one another. They were right. certainly not pacifists, but they were thinking their philosophy or the character's philosophy was you need one strong force to conquer everybody and force everybody to behave and then have a golden era of peace. Right. So that was what his philosophy was. But of course, Cobra Commander perverts it early on and has him thrown in the deepest, darkest hole in the terror drone. Well, he mm -hmm. escapes. And when he escapes, all of Cobra's worldwide activities come to a screeching halt as Cobra starts searching for this guy. Because mm -hmm. their worry is if he gets out and he starts telling people that, you know, no, Cobra's doing it all wrong then he's going to undermine their ability to recruit people and whatnot. And so yeah. they've got to recapture him. The Joes don't know who he is, don't know what he stand, what, what he is. He's the philosopher behind it. They only know that Cobra wants him back badly. And because of that, they have to get him first. They don't know why, right. but they just have to get him first. So right. there's this... The first part of the story is a race between Cobra and the Joes to find this guy and, and capture him. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the story is the Joes come to realize he's really an obnoxious jerk. You know, I mean, we, <laughs> yeah, we're not really happy that we've caught him now that we've got him. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, in the end, he manages to escape. And when he escapes, the Joes basically go, you know, screw it. Let him go. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. We don't need him. And so I pitched this idea to, to Hasbro and Hasbro says, oh, yeah, we like that a lot. Write it up. And so I wrote it up. I turned it into him. They, yeah, we approve this outline. You can go to script on it. Just make sure there's a place for the Cobra Emperor in it. I said, the who? And they said, well, the Cobra Emperor. And I said, well, who's the Cobra Emperor? And I said, well, he's the Supreme Commander of Cobra. And I said, well, what happened to Cobra Commander? Oh, he's still there. This, this guy is above Cobra Commander. I said, no, he's not. If he was above Cobra Commander, we would have known this in the first season. Yeah. If you had told us we want to introduce a superior officer at some point, we would have laid some track. We would have, we would have dropped the hints. We would have made those references so that when he comes in, oh, this is the guy they've a... been talking about. It, yeah, it's mm. not a WTF. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... They said, hmm, yeah, well, well, what would you suggest? And I said, well, you've, you've got to explain where he came from. He just can't be there all the time, and you suddenly introduce him. So they said, okay, we'll come up with a couple of ideas about where he comes from. So I came up with two ideas, and I tell writers, if someone says, come up with a couple of ideas, and you have one idea you really want to do, only do that idea. Don't do any other ideas. Because if they could come up with ideas, they'd come up with the ideas on their own. Okay. If right. they're asking you to come up with them, they're stuck. So whatever you want to do, just do that and don't give them any alternatives. So I came with two alternatives. I said, number one, they can build Serpentor. They can decide that Cobra Commander is too much of a screw up and they're just going to build a replacement for him out of the DNA of, uh, you know, all these these great warriors and generals of the past. Or number two, there can be a secret organization behind Cobra that even the rank and file of Cobra aren't aware of. Only Cobra Commander is aware of it. 
and they've been secretly funneling money into Cobra to keep it going all this time. And they said, well, we love that idea. And I said, you love which idea? And they said, both of them. Okay, so we do Arise, Serpentor, Arise, which is about creating Serpentor. Mm -hmm. And then the G.I. Joe movie was going to be about the secret organization that's behind Cobra. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to come up with, well, who is this organization? Where did they come from and whatnot? I suggested that it is some secret civilization that nobody knows about, a snake-based civilization so that it ties in with Cobra. It's hidden somewhere. And as a placeholder name and location, I said, it's just say for right now, it's in the Himalayas and we'll call it Cobra Law. Because I thought naming mm -hmm. it after the single most famous lost civilization in literature, somebody in the legal department will flag it down and say, you can't use that. And we will come mm -hmm. up with a better name and a better location. And because when they introduced Cobra Emperor, that was what they were going to call him, Cobra Emperor. And then about six months, not six months, six weeks into second season, they said, we're, we're changing his name from Cobra Emperor to King Cobra. And I went, yes, absolutely. I'll call him King Cobra all you want. I want to do a show where our chief bad guy is named after a malt liquor. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> so I kept my mouth shut, you know, so, okay, we'll call him King Cobra. And then somebody did a, a trademark check and whoops, can't do that. Can't be selling beer to kids. So he came Serpentor at that point. So I thought the same thing was going to happen. Somebody in their legal department would say, no, you can't call it Cobra Law. That's a ripoff of Shangri-La. We were stuck with it. As I advise writers now, if you have to come up with a placeholder name, come up with the most vile, obnoxious placeholder name you possibly can use that will force people to come up with a better name rather than accept it. I mean, Festering Monkey Hemorrhoid Island, <laughs> Granny's Body House. I mean, whatever it is, just come up with something that you absolutely oh cannot use. <laughs> I, to this day, I apologize for Cobra La. So the uh, book that I'm doing, the Kindle World's G.I. Joe novel, is a alternate timeline. This is a timeline where there is no Serpentor, there is no Cobra La. It's the basics as it was at the very beginning of the second season. I, I've been very careful about this because one of the reasons the book has taken as long to write as it has I have been out of the Joe mindset for so long mm -hmm. and I don't have the reference books that we used to have. We used to have these big, thick briefing books with all the characters and all the vehicles in them. So right. I didn't have that information at my fingertips. I looked it up online, but I mean, it wasn't available. It wasn't something I was immersed in all day long, seven days a week. And we also had the luxury when we were doing the animated series of, if I just write, the Joes jump in their tank and drive off, the animators can figure out if it's a Mobat or a Mauler. I don't have to tell them which tank it is. Just jump in a tank and drive off. Right. But when I'm writing this, I have to be very careful about the proper nomenclature, about right. the proper characteristics of the weapons. I've, I have found out that Hasbro didn't keep a close eye on this. And depending upon which media a vehicle or a weapon appears in, it has drastically different characteristics. I mean, yeah. between the card game, the uh, comic book, and the animated series, and the toys themselves, you can have up to four radically different capabilities for the same weapon or the same vehicle. And so when I was going through it, I had to go, what would have been the capabilities when we were doing the show? What would it have, what were its range, its speed and things like this? Right. It's a lot and, of research. Exactly. A and lot since this book, of research. And since the book is going to be going, be sold 
not primarily, but certainly a big hunk of the audience is going to be the G.I. Joe action figure collectors. I have to name the parts of the vehicles and the weapons and whatnot that are used properly. Because if I just say mm -hmm. he grabs the aiming, uh, he, if he grabs the sight, no, 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 that's not the sight. That is the long range aiming. Fine, I'll do that, right. but I have to look it up. I have to, to go mm -hmm. through. And there is a, a website called yojo.com that has, thank goodness, every blueprint and every instruction pack for every G.I. Joe toy ever. So I was able to get this information off of it. But again, it's a learning curve. You have to sit there and you have to go through, well, what's this called? What's that called? What's its speed? What's yeah. its range? Yeah, and the fans, they know. Any fandom you get into, the fans, there are a lot of fans who they know the particulars. I mean, in, just as an example of Star Trek fandom, there are people who actually speak the Klingon language that oh, know yeah. the yeah. Federation ships inside and out. And in Transformers, they know the capabilities of each individual character and their power level and what they can do and what they transform into. And, and exactly G with GI Joe, they know the vehicles, they know the characters, they know the weapons. They it's exactly very detail oriented. And these are very into intelligent, intellectual people who yes. get that deep into it. Yes. I happen to be one of them. <laughs> I view that as an obligation on my part, because when I'm writing a story that's coming, originating with me, for example, the Serenity Christian manga series that I did, or when I'm Poor Banished Children of Eve, which is the first book that is going to be coming out in just a few weeks, or The Rustlers of Rimrock, which is the third book, and I'm going to start final draft on that pretty soon. If I'm telling a story that is originating with me, I can change things around. I can go, oh, well, I've decided maybe it would be better if she was this instead of that. And I can just change that. I don't have to worry about fitting into something that somebody else has already done. But if I'm writing something like The Most Dangerous Man in the World, and I am letting G.I. Joe fans know about it and say, here is what would have been done back in the day if I had done it my way. I am, by honor, obliged to them to do the best possible job I can, and that means getting all the details right, or at least as many of the details right as I possibly can. I am sure I'm going to be hearing from people, well, you had it doing this when it does that in the comic book, and well, yeah, but I, I had like three different references that gave me three different capabilities, so I picked the one that worked for me. But I can't arbitrarily change characters. I can't arbitrarily introduce new vehicles or new major characters who are Joes. I mean, I've got a couple of, of Joe characters in the book. I have, for instance, Mary L., who actually appeared in the TV show. Mary L. was a female Joe that we created because we didn't have enough female Joes in the first season. And every now and then we would need, we felt, well, we, we ought to have at least one more female character. Mary Elle would, would show up. She was a mechanic, I believe, and she would be on the flight line or she'd be talking to somebody and it would only be like two or three lines of dialogue, but it would establish there was more than just Cover Girl and Scarlet and Lady J working for the Joes. But she was never a product. She was never a toy. She was just something that we created for the show. But I'm going to have Marielle in this thing. We also have uh, BJ, the General Hawk's driver. And that was mm -hmm. a joke that was around the office. We came up with a bunch of, of alternate G.I. Joes that we wanted to have. And one of them was Fodder, who was a big fat guy, who was like the first guy shot in every battle because he was the biggest target. Uh, <laughs> Oh, wow. I didn't include him, but BJ, I thought, well, yeah, the, Colonel, the General Hawk needs a driver. So Why BJ not? makes much belatedly her 30-year-old entrance. I have a couple of characters who are germane to this story and this story only. The philosopher character and college professor that he knows. And that's about it. Everything else are characters that have already been established. 
I mean, one right. of the biggest problems was Zartan and the Dreadnoughts because I couldn't keep their personalities straight after all these years. Mm -hmm. Writing something and going, well, wait a second, is this is this the Dreadnought that's the complete idiot or is this the Dreadnought who's the psychopathic literary major? And I'd have to go back and, <laughs> oh, crap, this is the literary major. Well, I got to go back and fix his dialogue now because – Literary major wouldn't say that. And I belatedly, when I got down to the climatic battle, I actually have stickum notes all the way around my computer screen <laughs> saying who is where in the battle at this particular point. And I should have done that with Zartan and the Dreadnoughts. I should have just put up a row of stickers that said, this one's the idiot. This one's the psychopathic literary major. This is this guy. It would have made life a lot easier for me at that point. <laughs> Sticky notes are so handy that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, and the other thing is, this is with poor banished Children of Eve, I have seven characters. Poor banished Children of Eve, it, I describe it as a World War II Lord of the Flies with Catholic schoolgirls. <laughs> and we've got, we've got seven. <laughs> okay. Seven. We've, we've got six girls and one young woman, a, a novice mm -hmm. nun who are shipwrecked on an island in the middle of the Pacific during World War II. World War II is raging all around them, and they have to survive on this island while the U.S. and the Japanese are pounding the crap out of each other. Right. And that's seven characters. There are other characters who appear at various points of the story, but they're not major characters. I only have seven major characters to worry about, it's real easy to keep those characters straight, to understand them, and just instinctively write them when they come up. Rustlers of Rimrock, it's a similar situation. I have, I, it's a story about four girls who are saving a herd of wild horses. Okay, I've got four girls. I've got one bad guy. I've got a few supporting characters around them. I don't have to keep track of, of dozens of people. Right. The next book that I'm working on, and I won't give you the title of that one yet, but the next book I'm okay. working on is set among high school students in a modern high school. So we're talking about in the neighborhood of a thousand kids attending this school. And right. I have a very large cast of characters that are going to be interrelating with one another because it's about something that happens in a community and affects to one way or another, everybody in the community, but affects them all differently. I have five or six key characters that are going to be the core of the story, but mm -hmm. all around them are going to be dozens of other characters. And some of them may only appear for a couple of pages and then they're out. And right. some may appear once and then disappear for several chapters and come back again. Others may touch periodically on the story. I've got to keep those characters straight when I start writing it. Yeah. And these are characters that I've created. And in my mind, I've already got their bios, their identities, who they are, their families, and this in my head. When I stopped working on G.I. Joe, and I've told this to people, when I finish with a project, I've learned to put it down and to walk away from it. And mm -hmm. people will say, well, what did you think of, of the Deke version of G.I. Joe? Or what did you think of that version of Transformers? And I tell them, honestly, I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I really have no desire to see it. I hope the people working on it had as good a time working on it as we did on the original right. series. And I hope the fans enjoyed it as much as our fans enjoyed ours. I don't right. begrudge anybody their pleasure. I am not resentful for anybody who came behind us and changed things because they had to. I understand that. But when I'm done, I'm done, and I move on to the next project. And right. G.I. Joe I was done with in the mid-'80s, mm -hmm. except for one little brief interaction in the mid-'90s. And I didn't, I didn't have a desire to do new material for G.I. Joe. And when the Kindle Worlds program started up, G.I. Joe Universe was one of the universes you could write a story in. I thought, I've got this story that I never had a chance to do. I really liked the story. I really wanted to do it. Maybe now's the time to do it. When I started, I honestly thought it was going to be, well, 
maybe I'll get 15, 17,000 words out of this. That'll be pretty good. And I can put that online and sell it for 99 cents. That, that wouldn't be too outrageous a price for 17,000 words, but it just couldn't be contained. And the research that went into it as it kept expanding and whatnot, and it was like a sort of Damocles. I didn't want to do a sloppy job. I didn't want to just blitz something out and then go back and have to fix it because that would have been just as time consuming. I wanted to do it properly from the beginning and it just took an enormous amount of time to, to keep everything straight, to keep everything the way it should be. I won't be giving any spoilers here, but right. Zartan and the Dreadnoughts appear in the middle portion of the story. And that was like one of the biggest stumbling blocks was just keeping them in character and maneuvering them around, doing what they had to do in order for the story to continue you know, the way it should. If I had been doing a similar story with characters I had created, I could have gotten through that very, very quickly, but it, it's my determination to do it where the fans, when they read it, will go, yes, I'm glad I spent my money on this. I'm glad I bought this book. This is what I had hoped it would be. And you can't do it by doing a shoddy job. Know that I am the one you seek. I am the one born to rule, destined to conquer. Let those who fear me follow me. Let those who oppose me die. For I am Serpentor, and this I command!